But I think inflammation is the key, all right? Yeah. Because when you have inflammation, you get poor quality eggs and you get poor quality embryos. And uh, when it tries to implant in the uterus, it's a very, very hostile environment. Well, hello everyone, it's Catherine Chong here, the Fertility Dietitian. Welcome to another of our live episode. As you can see, I am very, very excited today because we do have a very special guest fertility doctors joining us this afternoon. Thank you so much again for your time joining our live today. Um, this is certainly one of the popular lives because we have received so many questions about endometriosis and fertility. All right. So before we dive into the question, Dr. Samajo, I'm really curious to know from you first of all, um, when did you actually decide to specializing in fertility and pregnancy? Well, it's um, it's a difficult thing because um, uh, my career sort of come around a, a roundabout way and uh, I've landed here. Um, so basically, um, I was doing some assisting for a gynecologist and um, I got interested in laparoscopic surgery. Um, yeah. And then I thought I can do this. So I went um, about uh, sort of uh, training in obstetrics and gynecology. And yeah. uh, when I finished my training, I eventually found my way to city fertility um, and got into IVF. So I'm still enjoying um, yeah. the uh, operating, especially endometriosis surgery. Um, right. And I'm doing a whole lot of um, IVF at the moment. So um, I'm really enjoying my career. Oh, that's good to know. Thanks for sharing that. It's, it's not always good to know the reason why you're so passionate about this area and just really making that difference and impact on different people's lives. Okay, so we're going to dive in the questions um, which we have received from our audience. So first of all, I guess if you can just um, give us a blip of overview, what exactly is endometriosis? Endometriosis is a, um, we're not sure exactly what condition it is, but it, it could be multiple different conditions because it can present in so many different ways. But um, it's basically where we find tissues similar to the tissue inside the womb, but they exist outside the womb. Um, and that includes, um, you know, um, a glandular structures and stromal cells. And, um, it, and it tends to cause uh, a lot of scarring and inflammation in, um, in areas where it's unwanted. Um, so we can find endometriosis in the pelvis, we can find it in the ovary, we can find it in the tubes, the uterus, the cervix, the vagina, um, we can find it up near the diaphragm, um, around the appendix, in the, um, in the lungs, uh, we can find it in caesarean scars, in uh, laparoscopic scars, um, it can, it, it's, it's really a nasty disease and, um, and it can also grow into the womb, so you get conditions such as adenomyosis, which um, can cause problems with fertility as well. Uh, we got someone actually asked us th about this question as well. Quite often these conditions actually misdiagnose for many years and I certainly have read that it can take up to seven years before a clear diagnosis. So um, why does it take so long to be diagnosed for endometriosis? Well, um, there's many, many reasons, but um, yeah. uh, often with um, endometriosis, um, mm -hmm it tends to be a condition that with the very first period, it's very, very painful. Okay. Um, and young ladies go to their mothers to ask advice about this sort of thing. And, and their mothers often say, this is normal. Just, just live with it. Um, and it's usually because the mothers have had the same condition as well. And they think it's normal. Um, but if you're having a lot of trouble with your, your pain and, and so, we're presenting to a doctor to get a diagnosis is often difficult because doctors often don't believe that someone so young can have endometriosis. Yeah. Um, and so uh, the initial treatments for endometriosis are also things like using non steroidal anti-inflammatories, things like ibuprofen and naprogesic and Constan and all those sorts of things, and putting um, young ladies on, on the pill. And that often sort of um, improves the symptoms to a degree. But if the symptoms are sort of getting beyond what those um, uh, medications can fix, you should really be sent on to a, a gynecologist early on to get an early diagnosis and early treatment. 
So what is some of the key sign or um, at what point women should seek that help or, or cons like consult your GP or yourself or for the assessment? It's, it's a hard one because, um, you know, a lot of women get assessed for painful, heavy periods and, um, and not really much is found. But um, the true um, diagnosis of endometriosis is really uh, down to um, doing laparoscopic surgery and taking an actual biopsy from, uh, from what looks suspicious for endometriosis, looking at it under the microscope and getting a diagnosis. Yeah. Having said that, um, there are some specialised um, radiology and gynaecology groups out there who are doing ultrasound and MRI, um, yeah. who are getting very, very good at looking for changes of endometriosis. And so you can actually get an impression that there is endometriosis or adenomyosis purely from just looking at a... Um, um, a, a it's, it's a specialised form of ultrasound and uh, MRI that requires a specialised form of report, um, specialised people to actually look at these um, uh, films to, to give us a diagnosis. Um, yeah. And, um, you know, we're getting very, very good at that now. The radiologists are getting really good at it. The, um, um, the specialist um, um, uh, obstetrician gynaecologists who do sonography are getting really good at it as well. So um, it's, it's getting... Um, easier to spot it these days. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Um, so my next question is from, from our audience as well. How does it actually affect fertility in terms of in what way? Well, if you have a mild degree of adenomyosis or endometriosis, it has probably very minimal effect. Um, mm. So when, as you get older, you know, the, the endometriosis and adenomyosis grows because you're cycling. You know, when, when you have a cycle, the estrogens go up and they go down. That cycling effect actually makes endometriosis and adenomyosis grow. So you get to a point in your life where you've accumulated so much disease that it causes problems. And the way it causes those problems, as I said before, um, it causes scarring. It causes inflammation. And I think inflammation is the key. I think that's okay. that's where it causes infertility. I mean, it can cause things like the scarring can cause things like blocking your tubes and um, binding everything together. It's hard for the sperm to get to the egg and then for the fertilised egg to get back okay. into the womb. All that sort of stuff happens. But I think inflammation is the key, all right, key. because when you have inflammation, you get poor quality eggs and you get poor quality embryos. And uh, when it tries to implant in the uterus, it's a very, very hostile environment uh, for that. Yeah that uh, tiny little embryo. Um, now, the next question is from one of our viewers as well. Um, so she asked, does it make a difference if there is no endometrioma, which is the presence of endometrial tissues in the ovary? Um, I think, Dr. Stamacho, you have mentioned quite a bit, a lot of it could be inflammation, but was there any things that you would like to add on? If there's no endometrioma, how does it can affect fertility? Well, the, the, it doesn't matter where the endometriosis is. If it's anywhere near the pelvis, it does affect it. So it doesn't have to actually be in the ovary. So an endometrioma is actually a cyst of endometriosis tissue within the ovary. Um, they're also called chocolate cysts. So whenever yeah. you have a period, um, you tend to have a bleed. Uh, these yeah. cysts, they bleed internally and the, um, uh, the blood sort of collects inside. And when you open them up, it, um, it looks, it's, it's altered blood and it looks like a thick um, uh, chocolate syrup uh, when you open mm. them up. But it's actually where the lining attaches to the ovary where it causes the inflammation. Now, treating of endometriomas is a, um, a controversial thing. Um, some people say you need to treat anything that's over two centimetres and others say over four centimetres. But, the truth is that they all cause inflammation. Um, but when treating an endometrioma, removing it, you need to basically peel that um, endometriotic tissue away from the normal ovarian tissue. And as you do that, you may actually be taking away some good um, uh, ovarian tissue and, and with that, some good eggs. And so often, um, you know, endometriosis is... Um, a cause of low ovarian reserve. So for some reason, women that have endometriosis and adenomyosis have a lower AMH level, so anti-malarian hormone, 
um, and then doing surgery on, on the ovaries to remove endometrial tissue actually lowers that ovarian reserve even further. Um, but yeah. what it does do is that it actually solves the problem of inflammation. And once you get over the, um, you know, once you, the healing is over after an operation, it, it generally takes about four to six weeks for the uh, inflammation related to the surgery to, um, to settle. Um, yeah. Then um, you tend to get better quality eggs, even though you get less eggs, they tend to be better quality and uh, improves chances of uh, success. So most people who do IVF, if there's an endometrioma there, you try doing some IVF first to see what sort of quality eggs you're getting, what sort of quality embryos you're getting, and yeah. whether it's actually implanting. Um, and then if it's not working, I tend to go to surgery to uh, remove that problem and, and solve that, that issue. Okay. Thanks for that. I think, Dr. Samato, you explained it really well. Um, and you, you did also mention about adenomyosis earlier on. Um, yes. Can you tell us a little bit what's the difference and does it impact fertility as well for women with diagnosis with adenomyosis? Well, you know, I went through six years of medical school being told that adenomyosis has little effect on um, women's periods and, and fertility. Um, when you get out the other side of medical school and, and do O&G training, um, you quickly find out that it actually causes a huge amount of problems. Um, so generally when with adenomyosis, as I said, the, the disease accumulates over time. Um, yeah. So it grows over time. And what it is is basically the endometrial tissue from the lining actually grows deep into the muscle. Um, yeah. And so there's, there's deep glands inside the muscle um, of the womb and um, uh, together with stroma and then that causes inflammation again. Um, and, and so what tends to happen is that um, you have um, a situation where um, when women are about to have a period, their premenstrual symptoms actually start often two, three, four, five days before um, and then they get heavy periods and very painful periods as a result of the adenomyosis. And as I said earlier with the inflammation, the toxic chemicals that are released, um, like the interleukins and the cytokines and, and all those um, um, uh, terrible chemicals that are released with inflammation, they're tox toxic to the embryos. So you get poor implantation. Um, and if you do get implantation in a setting of um, mild to moderate adenomyosis, those placentas yeah. don't tend to form so well. And so okay. you can actually get problems in pregnancy, yeah. things like um, preterm delivery, small birth weight, um, preeclampsia. All those things are more common in women with amyosis. Wow. Right. Has that answered all your questions? I can't. Yeah, yeah I think so. <laughs> really, really good. So to summarize that, both endometriosis and adenomyosis had some degree definitely affecting fertility, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, um, we've got a, another question as well from our audience here. So she is very interested to find out is it possible to conceive naturally um, now that she has diagnosed with endometriosis? Yes, as I said, when the disease is, is not too great, um, yeah. then the inflammation, you know, if there's only a little bit of inflammation, a little bit of disease, um, you know, mild to moderate disease, you can fall pregnant, you can have a successful pregnancy. But as I said, the, um, the chances of things like um, uh, pregnancy complications are a little bit higher. Um, so yeah. an obstetrician was always... Um, looking after you during your pregnancy needs to be vigilant uh, about finding these problems early and treating them early uh, to get yeah. a good outcome with the pregnancy. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So um, yes, you can conceive naturally and you can, you know, nine months of pregnancy also is very, very good at suppressing the disease because what happens when you're pregnant is that you're not cycling. Um, yeah the estrogen's not going up and down. What you have is a high progesterone state um, and um, um, that tends to suppress the disease. So women who struggle to get pregnant the first time um, uh, they want to get pregnant may take you know, a few years to get pregnant, but if, um, if you have nine months of pregnancy, that's suppressive therapy. Um, it allows women to fall pregnant more easily the second time round. doesn't always work for everyone, but you know, um, that, that is a common 
finding is that the second pregnancy is often easier to conceive in those women who have got mild to moderate endometriosis. Sure, sure. And um, how important do you think that the role of, I guess, nutrition, diet and lifestyle in managing endometriosis? Oh, look, you know, the management of endometriosis is a multidisciplinary thing. Okay, yeah. so I deal with... Um, um, you know, physiotherapists, we have specialized pelvic floor physiotherapists that deal with our patients. We sometimes need to send them to sex therapists because sex is so painful that they need to find a way. Is can't get pregnant without sex, I guess. And um, and then things like uh, lifestyle changes, nutrition, so keeping a, um, a normal weight, doing some sort of exercise um, is always very helpful um, in reducing... Um, uh, stress and um, uh, inflammation and then having a, a a low inflammatory diet is often very 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 important um, and I think you've touched on this stuff before um, yeah. in one of your your live chats that's right it's a very much like a Mediterranean style of eating pattern to help to reduce yes. the inflammation as well yeah yeah yeah, so, uh, so it's all, look, every every little thing that you do actually adds value and improves your chances of um, of pregnancy. So I'm I'm actually very very happy to work with other uh, clinicians mm -hmm. to help get a good result. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, we got our another questions here came through as well. Um, so she actually gives us a bit of background uh, journey. So. She said that after years of misdiagnosed with endometriosis, she finally had a surgery three years ago to remove lots of tissue. And then she did another two rounds of IVF, uh, unfortunately resulted in miscarriage due to poor egg quality. She then also tests all her remaining frozen eggs, unfortunately all came back uh, with low, uh, poor quality as well. Uh, she's currently 41 years old and she wondered, Dr. Simaccio, if you can suggest anything to improve egg quality and also what's the next best treatment for her? Uh, <laughs> look, there's a, there's a lot of things that, uh, that's, a, uh, that's a very loaded question. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, look, there's a lot of things that affect egg quality and mm -hmm. some of those things are under our control and a lot of those things are not under our control. So one yeah. of the things that's not under our control is the woman's age. Okay, so, so just yeah. to give you a perspective, if you're sort of between 20 and about 32 years of age, you probably need about 10 to 12 eggs to get a baby. All right, so one of those 10 to 12 eggs is gonna be good enough to give you a baby. So when you're 35, you probably need about 15. When you're 40, you need about 20, and, and it goes on. So when you're 41, 42, you probably need 20 to 25 eggs, um, but a good egg will eventually come along, okay? Yeah. What you can do, um, is basically control, you can't control your age, but you can control um, what goes into your body, okay? Yeah. And so we tend to give adjuvant therapies and individually these adjuvant therapies are not yeah. statistically significant in changing, um, you know, um, uh, pregnancy rates. But my, my take on it is if, if we get 1% or 2% improvement with this therapy and 1% or 2% with this one and this one, it all adds up. And, um, and that's what you, we do. So we put women on, um, you know, women who are older have issues with their nutrition as well um, because you're not going to absorb all the good um, uh, vitamins and minerals from your diet as well when you're 41 as when you were 25. And so we've got to be mindful of that. So we give women a good uh, pregnancy multivitamins. Um, we, um, I often add in things like CoQ10 and fish oil because of the antioxidant effects. Um, these, drug, these medications also help with circulation. So good circulation and good nutrition is key to um, uh, good egg health. Now, yeah. eggs lay dormant, all right? They're created when you're... Sick by the time you're 16 weeks um, gestation inside your mother's belly, all the eggs you're ever going to have have been created. And there's about 5 million of them. 
Yeah. When you're born, there's only about a million left. And when you've hit puberty, there's about half a million left. The majority of women who cycle every month have about 20 or 30 of these eggs that come out of dormancy every month. And it's usually the best egg and the best follicle that ovulates. Now, they actually start coming out of dormancy about three months ago. And mm -hmm. so what you do to your eggs in that last final three months um, really affects their quality. So I make sure yeah. that women are eating healthily. Okay, yeah. lots of greens and vegetables, uh, not too high fatty food, um, and um, are taking are taking some sort of supplements to help with antioxidants and and all that sort of thing, and then controlling yeah. things like you know no smoking, um, limiting alcohol, limiting caffeine, mm -hmm. things like that are all helpful in improving egg quality. And we do have other adjuvants that are helpful in some women uh, with, with low egg reserve, things like DHEA, especially if, if they're a little bit older. And I tend to use it in those who are over 38. Um, and there's a whole lot of other adjuvants that people use to yeah. help uh, with egg yeah. quality. Yeah, I So really it's a long, long answer yeah. to a short question, sorry. I think you covered really, really well. It's sort of like what I teach my patients as well, so that's great to know. Um, I remember during our last chat as well with you, Dr. Samarjo, we, we briefly also chatting about the influence of environmental um, chemical exposure as well. That could also have some degree influencing our body hormones, isn't it? If you want to just quickly cover yeah, this is this it. is a can of worms. There's, uh, there's lots of chemicals, you know, I, I were recently went to a conference where they talked about yeah. environmental chemicals and um, in the last 50 years or so, yeah. uh, man has created something like 60,000 different chemicals. Um, wow. And we can find traces of all these chemicals in our bodies. Now, it's, you know, with PPEs and, you know, uh, PTs and, and all sorts of the other, there's fertilizers, there's um, the, uh, the fire retardants that are being used, there's all sorts of different plastics. Um, yeah. you, know, you know, there's, there's, a, um, there's a thing out there that says that in, you know, with all the little plastic that sort of floats around in you know, diet and everything, that we probably ingest enough plastic um, in a calendar year that is enough to make a credit card oh my so God. this is yeah. you know it's really yeah. scary stuff but, you know when you think about you know what's around us and what we're getting in our diet you know we are inadvertently even if you're trying to eat healthily and try to eat um you know unprocessed foods and things like that you're still getting these toxins into your body but you can do things take steps to sort of minimize the toxins going into your body you're not going to get rid of all of them Exactly. But we'll you, can, you can certainly minimise yeah. as much as possible and, and avoid um, the, those environmental um, um, toxins that are that are being included in our bodies. Yeah. Wow. Thank you, Dr. Stamacho. That was really, really um, great that you share your expertise. Now we're going to change our pace to do a little fun game. It's called a quick round of fun rapid question, just so that we have a chance to get to know you outside work. Okay. Yeah, okay. All right. Are you ready? Yeah, well, I'm not sure <laughs> so, about this, but anyway, far away. <laughs> all right. All right. So the first question, um, what is the first thing you do when you wake up in the morning? Uh, I creep out of bed to stop, uh, you know, I don't, don't want to wake up my wife. I, I've got to be really quiet in the mornings. Is it? What time she, do you she's wake not up? A morning right? person. She's oh, not a morning she's person. Uh, I'll I wake hope up really she's early. Not listening to our life. <laughs> <laughs> she's, she's listening. She's listening. Oh, <laughs> okay, all right. Now, second question for you Name a person who inspired you to become a doctor. Um, there's a, a fellow called Dr. Petrov. Um, he was the brother, of, I don't, can't even remember his, his first name, but he was the brother of one of the kids in my class when I was in year seven. And okay. he came to chat to us because he was an old boy of the, um, of the school, the primary school that I went to. And, okay. um, and I just thought this guy's really impressive. And he was actually a doctor and became a radiologist. And um, I was just so impressed that that's, that's the first idea that I had that I wanted to be a doctor. Wow. 
a great six, did you say? A great seven. Yes, yeah, seven, yeah. Wow, yes, yeah, seven. Okay. Wow. Okay. And you did become a very well known doctor now, isn't it? So that that's good. Oh, yeah. Um <laughs> no, no. Okay, next question. Have you ever appeared on a TV show? I don't think so. I've been interviewed a few times, um, but you know, this is not the face for TV. Oh, okay. Maybe the next one, <laughs> the next big show will, will come to you soon. And uh, what is your favorite holiday spot? Oh, uh, we, um, we just like to holiday locally. So, um, you know, we just go to, um, to the Gold Coast uh, most of the time and, um, you know, we, we love it there. And the other place we love to go is Melbourne. We love Melbourne for some reason. <laughs> oh, good. So you don't mind the cooler weather at all, isn't it, for a holiday? No, as long as they've got coffee down there, I'm there. <laughs> yeah, they're famous for their coffee, isn't it? <laughs> all right. Two more questions. Um, second last question. What is your hidden talent? I'm so curious to know. Oh, uh, in my past life, um, I tried <laughs> yeah. to get into orthopedics. And oh. um, but, um, every now and again, my carpentry skills come out. But, um, wow. you know, I'm, I'm, I, I consider myself a very good handyman around the house. But um, the you, other, the other one gri the my wife, yeah, so one, of the, one of the things my wife um, um, doesn't like about my uh, handyman skills is that I start all these projects, but I never yeah. finish any of them. It's just too busy in my job. I just never finish anything. <laughs> so certainly a little sports, isn't it? Just like waiting for you to complete your project. <laughs> oh yeah, like uh, yeah, lots of projects at home, sort of half finished. <laughs> all right, all right. Now, final question for you, Dr. Sumatio. What is the favorite part of your job? Oh, look, you know, we um, we get great joy from seeing uh, people going from difficulty with their fertility to get seeing them on the other side when they're holding their baby in their in their arms. Um, so, you know, it's it's a really satisfying job for us. And um, I don't always get to hold the babies because my secretary has always hogged the babies. I don't know why, but, you know. <laughs> Yeah, to be busy with other things as well. But that, that's, I, I guess that's the beauty of like you as well, is to seeing through them overcome those fertility challenges and getting through that pregnancy like you know, a phase and then finally is holding that baby. It's just such a beautiful thing. That I mean, for, just... for me also, yeah, for me, one of the compliments that I think is yeah. it's not, it's not really a compliment that people come out and say openly, but, you know, when people come back um, yeah. uh, to see you for future fertility or even for future gynecological needs, um, that sort of gives me a vote of confidence that they're actually happy with the way I've treated them. So, yeah. um, you know, I'm old enough now to have had a lot of patients come back for, uh, for further <laughs> treatments. Okay, so... Yeah. Oh, that, that, that's it's, great. It's always, that. it's always a compliment to me that they, um, that they still trust me yeah. after all those years. They just trust me to look after them. That's right. That's right. All right, then, Dr. Stamatio, thank you again for being here and sharing all your expertise. It's such a great chat. I'm sure that a lot of us are learning a lot from you. Um, can you tell everybody here, Dr. Stamatio, where can they find you? How can they book a consultation with you? Oh, look, um, I, um, uh, you can ring up for an appointment on um, uh, 073613 um, and talk to my lovely secretaries, Renee or Natasha. Um, and um, basically all I need is a referral from your local doctor um, but, and I can sort of work out the rest. Um, so we're, we're sort of mainly working out of our rooms at Newstead. So we're at 32 Doggett Street, Newstead. Um, I do also work on Monday and, and Wednesday afternoons at Sunnybank through the McCulloch um, uh, Centre. Um, and uh, also on Thursday afternoons at, um, at North Lakes uh, Westfield. So just opposite the, um, uh, the cinemas there.
Once again, thanks everyone for joining us. Um, and we'll see you again very soon in our next live. Bye. Well, thank Bye. you so much. It's been a pleasure. It's been a pleasure. Bye-bye. <laughs>